A warm welcome to the Maison de la Paix. My name is uh, Philippe Burin. I'm the director of the Graduate Institute. It's a great honor and a true privilege to host for this uh, round table organized in partnership with the uh, Canadian and US permanent missions. Uh, this round table um, with uh, three uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize uh, laureates. For us as an academic institution, human rights uh, has always been one of our main focus in teaching and research with uh, a number of uh, very distinguished professors, among them Andrew Clapham, who sits here, and, uh, and a student body hugely interested in that field. As academics, we are also strongly committed to the defense and promotion of, of human rights because we think that the universal respect is in the best interest of a well-functioning international system and peaceful development of human societies. So thank you all for coming. We are looking forward to listen to our distinguished speakers, and I hand over the micro, the micro to uh, Ambassador Harper from the U.S. Permanent Mission. Hey, thank you, Professor. Um, and thank you to the Graduate Institute for hosting uh, this event. Uh, I, I, I recognize that I'm not the one people want to hear from, so this is going to be very brief. Just say welcome to all of you, welcome to my colleagues in the diplomatic community. Uh, we thought as a matter, and, and, and on behalf of both Canada and the United States, the permanent missions of Canada and the United States, we welcome you here. Uh, we thought as in conjunction with the 31st session of the Human Rights Council on this, the 10th anniversary of the Human Rights Council, it was appropriate to listen to some of our uh, recognized uh, people who could share their thoughts about the state of human rights, and in particular, uh, some, some th thinking on uh, the role of civil society. So with that, I will turn it over to our esteemed uh, Deputy High Commissioner, Kate Gilmore, who uh, we uh, welcome here and thank, thank you, for, 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 for uh, moderating uh, this, this panel. Thank you. What an extraordinary moment. Your Excellencies, our esteemed Nobel laureates, colleagues, friends, our panel today is convened for a very special purpose. It's an opportunity for us all uh, to explore together the very particular and essential role that human rights plays in creating civil society, civil society, expanding that space and enabling it, and the manner in which civil society in turn enables rights. It's our privilege that uh, as we contemplate these issues, we be nourished. And we are nourished by the perspectives of this extraordinary panel today. They rank amongst, surely, the most inspirational examples of that reality, which is it takes courageous people, defiant, brave, principled people as human rights defenders for there to be a global advance of human rights. Our panellists are Nobel Peace Laureates. They are peace seekers. They are inspiring luminaries. They are activists for human rights. And it is my immense pleasure to introduce them to you. The extraordinary Tawakul Carmen has many names. She's been called many names. In Yemen, she's known as the Iron Woman. She is known... <laughs> Yay! <laughs> She's also known, at an incredibly young age, I might say, as the mother 
of the nation. <laughs> She's been at the forefront of the human rights struggle in Yemen as an advocate for the power and the essential asset that is freedom of expression and freedom of the press. She was the co-founder in 2015 of Women Journalists Without Chains, and she foresaw the Arab Spring and the longing for a deep and personal democracy. And in 2007, she began to person weekly demonstrations that just grew and grew and grew into powerful pro-democracy movements. It is such an honour to have you with us. Thank you, Dean. Well, women and journalists. I want to make note, actually, personal democracy. And in 2007, <laughs> she began to... I've never listened to myself ever before. <laughs> I feel anxious for you that you have to listen to me. There's no reason to listen to me twice. <laughs> I wanted to make mention that, uh, in fact, uh, Tawakul was the youngest ever Nobel Peace Laureate. Until that young upstart, <laughs> Malawa, <laughs> Malala, you <laughs> Safai. <laughs> and uh, we're so delighted to have that emphasis on the power of young people to claim, name, and stand for rights. Speaking of young people, Layla. Layla Al Karam is an Irani lawyer. She is an extraordinary human rights activist from Tehran. She works to raise awareness of the situation of women in Iran, and she defends women's rights campaigners who have been persecuted, subjected to persecution by the Iranian authorities. Layla is the executive director of the Centre for Supporters of Human Rights, founded by a fellow Iranian lawyer, Shiran Ibadi. You know, the courageous visionary Sharana Badi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003 for her groundbreaking, death-defying work as a lawyer and a human rights defender. And she has lived in ex exile, as does Layla, from Iran since 2009. Layla, it's such an honour to have you here, and through you, we send our greatest solidarity to Sharina Badi. Thank you. Dear friends, this week we celebrated International Women's Day, and as a woman I have chosen to introduce women first. And I want to note with real thanks to US Ambassador Pamela Hamamoto uh, that through her leadership there has been introduced a gender champion program across the UN in Geneva. And many of us now share a commitment to not participate on panels that only have male contributors. Uh, thankfully, today, the challenge was in the other direction. Now, <clears throat> looking at the list of Nobel laureates, it was very hard to identify a man. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, that's a typo. Um, in all seriousness, we are truly gifted today to have a man among men with us. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, a Nobel laureate, is a global figure of such standing that somehow, sir, we feel that you belong to all of us. You are, of course, a remarkable spiritual leader, but His Holiness is also renowned for his advocacy of peace, religious tolerance and human rights. If I may say, also famous for his laughter. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 and we're enormously honoured to have you with us here today. It is now my great pleasure to hand the floor to Layla to share with us your journey and your insights into the criticality of the civil society space for the advance of rights. Thank you, Layla. Thank you. 
Your Holiness, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Salam. In Arabic, the word Salam means peace. And we use the same expression in Persian for greeting. Prophet Muhammad enjoined his followers to replace good morning or good afternoon by Salam Alaik, which means may peace be upon you. And the big question is, why a small number of individuals and some non-democratic governments are violating human rights and depriving women of their basic rights in the name of Islam. I'm honored to be here to share my view on human rights. There is so much I would like to talk, but unfortunately I can't due to limited time I have. So I will highlight a few facts about women's human rights and the situation of those who defend them, a mere drop in the ocean. I'm sure that you agree with me that women's rights is a contested issue. Unfortunately, discrimination against women still exists in all human societies, and in each region and civilization, it manifests itself in a different way. I bring you an example from India, in the city of Varnasi, you see women who are clad in white cotton robes and sh have shaved heads. There are individuals whose husbands have died and their fundamentalist families have banished them to the city to leave the world behind and live there until they die. In Africa, women are struggling with many wrong traditions and practices. For example, in Liberia, a country the president of which is a female Nobel Peace Laureate, more than one third of women have experienced FGM, and they are all followers of Christianity. In some European countries, women are paid one fourth less than men. Unfortunately, we have recently witnessed a worse kind of violence against women, and it is a crime committed by ISIS which calls itself Islamic State. We witnessed that ISIS captured women and gave them to its supporters as a slaves. And the most painful thing is that ISIS announces that his actions are in conformity with the Sharia. Another issue is a crisis of refugees coming to Europe for a better life, but face another form of violence and repression. And at the same time, I'm happy to see how ordinary people leave their comfortable homes and come to help the refugees. These show the power of civil society and the fact that every one of us can make a change. Violence against women is harsher in Islamic countries in view of the fact that the law endorses it in many instances. Iranian women have suffered discrimination both before and after 1979 Islamic Revolution. The age of criminal responsibility for girl is nine, while a boy cannot be prosecuted until he is 15. In fact, in Iran, a nine-year-old girl is actually regarded as an adult woman. Under Iranian law, the nationality of a woman is not automatically transferred to her children. However, the same does not apply for a man. Consequently, there are approximately 20,000 children in Iran who lack a birth certificate simply because their fathers are not Iranian citizens, although their mothers are Iranian nationals. The main justification for discriminatory laws against women is that they are based on Sharia and therefore cannot and should not be challenged. For decades, Iranian women have struggled to prove that Sharia does not discriminate against women per se. They challenge the discriminatory roles, arguing that the patriarchal norms and traditions inserted into Islamic law deprive women of equal rights. This has been a difficult task, very difficult task for Iranian women. Right now, as I'm talking to you, 
some women's rights defenders are spending their lives in prison because they refuse to be silenced, whether in voicing their political and religious beliefs, raising their ethnic demands, or simply challenging gender-related restrictions that are imposed on them as women. Bahar Hedayat is a student activist and a human rights defender, currently serving her nine and a half year sentence on the false accusation of propaganda against the state. Her only crime is promoting human rights and democracy in Iran. Zainab Jalilian, a 33 years old Kurdish citizen, was initially sentenced to death for her so-called political activities. Her, her death sentence has now been commuted to life imprisonment. Nargis Mohammadi, as a vice president for the Defender for Human Rights Center, is in prison for, he, for her human rights activities, of course, for also being a member of the Mention Center. She is a mother of two, and she hasn't seen her children for almost six months. And these are just a few. A state repression may be present the main obstacle to the activities of women human rights defenders. In line with the theory of the Velvet Revolution, most social and human rights activists, including women human rights defenders, are seen as a threat to national security. In fact, the hardliners within the government have regarded these women as their political opponents and done their best to control, confront, and repress them. Women human rights defenders have repeatedly declared that they don't want to bring down the regime in Iran. On the contrary, they are challenging the status quo because they are passionate about their country and their Iranian identity. Now, as a Muslim woman who was born and raised in Iran, studied law, including Islamic law, at university, became a lawyer, and has been fight for gender equality, I deem it necessary to respond to the question of whether Islamic Sharia condones the oppression of women. Do discriminatory and anti-female laws, selling of women and girls into slavery, FGM, and honor killings arise out of the religion of Islam? Can one not be a Muslim and at the same time respect the equality of human beings, including gender equality? To respond to this question, I must say of an issue that fundamentalism can exist in any religion, in Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, so on and so forth, as, I, as highlighted in aforementioned examples. However, the interesting point is that only Islamic fundamentalism in, is discussed in some Western media, which indirectly suggests that only Muslim can do acts so violently. I had read very little in the media about the massacre of Muslim in Rohingya, the massacre of Chechen Muslim by the Russian government and Christian fundamentalism is rarely discussed. A number of media have closed their eyes to the fundamentalism and violence of the Jews or endeavor to justify it. Therefore, when information communicated accurately, we would come to realize that fundamentalism may unfortunately exist in any religion or system of belief. I am a Muslim woman, and I'm really tired of proving myself. I am saddened and seeing abuse and violence happening in non-democratic Islamic countries justified in the name of Islam. I am disappointed at seeing people being subject to discrimination because of their religion. And I'm weary of answering the immigration officers' questions when they see my Iranian passport. But coming from a country, when I have been questioned for everything I've done, I've learned not to give up. Being a Muslim, I'm constantly asked if women in the Muslim world should rely on Islam to bring about change in the current legal status of women. And my answer, with no doubt, 
is yes. Over 90% of Iran's population is Muslim. This demographic reality makes it essential to use religious discourse to tack the, gen the gendered nature of Iranian law. For example, the Quran provides for mutual divorce, or khul'a, balancing the right of spouses in the case of divorce. These teachings should be used in addressing unequal treatment of men and women in divorce cases. Persistence is key. And I'll, I'll give you a personal example to demonstrate. In 2008, I defended in ca a case in which my client filed for divorce on the basis that she hated her husband. And this placed her in an undesirable situation that was very harmful for her as well as for the family. In court, in addition to the civil code, I discussed the ruling of denial of harm, which is acceptable to Islam as a, as a way to prevent hardship. I also referred to the Quran, which allows for khul'a or mutual divorce, and dis discussed the opinion of some Islamic juries, such as Ayatollah Sani'i, and asked the judge to implement the civil code in line with the Quran and grant my client a divorce. Fortunately, after some prolonged court session, the judge granted the divorce on the basis that the continuation of marriage would be harmful to my client. Iran is a society with rapidly changing norms in relation to women's status. Yet the discourse with respect to women's rights had its place in Islam. It's a discourse that challenged hardline Muslims who oppose women's rights on the ground that they are not Islamic, and also speak to, to a government and legal system that claim it is based on Islamic law. But Islamic discourse is important for the average person who wants to marry his or her, her religious beliefs with a belief in human rights, equality, and dignity. These people are empowered to stand behind their human rights principles without abandoning their religious beliefs. So to build a broad movement and unite like-minded people, it is important to, but, to argue that Islam and human rights are not mutually exclusive and that Islam supports human rights. Now another question that I've always come across. How should the West help women in Islamic countries? And I wonder, do we need the West to rescue us? Are we happy to be considered the others that are victim and need mercy? It is, right that all, is it right that all brave Muslim women in Iran, Afghanistan, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, and many other countries are deemed as passive individuals waiting for help? We should not forget that Muslim women including Iranian women, have never played a passive way. They've used any tools available to them to challenge discriminatory laws and practices. So the West should change its view. It should change its policy toward Islamic countries and Muslim women. As Sohrab Sepehri, an Iranian poet, said, چشم ها را باید شست، جوری دیگر باید دید. Eyes should be washed, so our views will change. Modern Muslim, and particularly Muslim women, expect the media, civil societies, and universities in Western countries to assist them to promote modern Islamic thought and to carry their voice to the people of the world. Modern Islamic thought should be valued the books and articles of enlightened Muslims should be translated and published. And most importantly, those governments that claim to respect human rights should refrain from supporting fundamentalist Islamic government until they change their ways. We should not forget that a number of fundamentalist Islamic countries in the Middle East, which severely trample upon the rights of women, are close friends of the West. The West, the West signed commercial contracts with them, condoning their violation of human rights 
on the pretext of cultural relativism, which I'm really tired of this cultural relativism. <laughs> dear, dear friends, when we don't know something, we fear it. And when we fear it, we lose our calm. And when we lose our, once we lose our calm, we come to hate the person or things that cause it. Therefore, as long as the people of the world do not know each other, do not know each other religion and civilization, no sustainable peace can be established. We are in 2016. I'm sure that you agree with me that everything can be solved through negotiations. Iranian government has made peace with the U.S., a country that was considered to be its enemy after 37 years. Civil society plays an important role in creating dialogue among nations. We are here in Geneva. A state and civil society organization can meet each other and reach out to each other more easily than anywhere else. We should work together to fight ideologies that oppress women's rights and ignore human rights. We, are, we have witnessed the fundamentalist fear of education to the extent that they tried to assassinate Malala Yousafzai for only being pro-education. More than 65% of university students in Iran are women. Government adopted some sex segregated policies and regulation to prevent women from studying certain subjects or taking certain jobs. But they doubted they've been successful in silencing Iranian women. Consequently, we must change our method of fighting against fundamentalism in order to obtain results. Otherwise, the world shall witness increasing disorder and chaos. I was one year old when the Islamic Revolution happened in Iran. I witnessed eight years of Iran-Iraq war. I was a law student at Tehran University when Iranian student protests of July 1999, known as Kuwait disaster or fatal attack of, of university dormitories, happened. I started my law practice during Khatami or Reform era. I defended women human rights activists in the Revolutionary Court during Ahmadinejad presidency. Still, I am hopeful that the record of human rights will be improved in Iran. Because we have a strong civil society and human rights defenders that are willing to pay the price of freedom, whatever it would be. President Rouhani has promised to desecuritize the general atmosphere and to promote justice and civil rights. The president, as the most senior elected official in the Islamic Republic, is responsible under the Constitution to protect his citizens. Boosted by the victory of his moderate allies in recent election in Iran, President Rouhani is now in a strong position to pursue the much neglected human rights challenges, challenges facing his country. With the nuclear dossier now almost closed, thanks God, and his main campaign promise delivered, Rouhani is being urged to shift his attention towards human rights. His promise of establishing a citizen's rights charter is yet to materialize. He needs to address crit critical issues, such as the alarming rate of execution, including juvenile. According to Amnesty International, Iran remains a prolific execu executioner, second only to China. The Vice President for Women of and Family Affairs said recently that the entire adult man population of a village in southern Iran had been executed for drug offenses. The high number of prisoners of conscience languishing behind bars, the situation of religious and minorities, the high number of landmine victims, and the issue of Afghan refugees are amongst other human rights matters that should be addressed by President Rouhani. And for the women's rights, I think the only way to reach sustainable change in favor of women is through the amendment of our constitution and the removal of substantial legal obstacles. If President Rouhani honor his promise 
and desecuritize the general atmosphere, the work of human rights defenders could lead to significant and tangible change in the human rights situation in Iran. This develop development could help Iran to improve its human rights record in the international arena. Of course, moving forward, we keep our message alive. We continue our fight for gender equality. It would be a difficult process, but the day will eventually come when women will enjoy gender equality in Iran. Thank you for having listened to me so patiently. Thank you. Leila, you've moved us and inspired us, and we thank you for the courage that you represent and for the strength of your voice and the power of your determination. Thank you. It is my great pleasure and a thrill to now hand the floor very much uh, with uh, enthusiasm to uh, Tawakul Karami and Carmen, and uh, we thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Now you know the meaning of Assalamu alaikum, which means peace be upon all of you. Assalamu alaikum again. So you have to say, Wa alaikum salam. <laughs> I am so happy to be with you here. I am so happy to be in Geneva. Thank you for the, for the ambassador of United uh, uh, States and also uh, for uh, Ambassador of Canada for inviting me to be here. And um, I am so glad to be here um, in this um, symposium at the margin of the meeting uh, of uh, United Maglis Hukuk al Insan, which is Human Rights Council. I will speak with you in a very simple English, okay? <laughs> When I have any difficulty, I will ask my colleagues to help me. <clears throat> they told me when they sent me the invitation that I should talk about our prospection as Nobel laureates about the human rights. So the most important answer of this thing, that there is no special definition from Nobel laureates on human rights. It's the same definition from everybody around the world. It's the Charter of, of International Human Rights. It's the conventions, it's the agreements of human rights. It's the values of justice, of freedom, of democracy, of rule of law. It's the values of equality, of equal citizenship. It's the values of prosperity. So, when we talk about human rights now, we should put a very important question. What is the reality of human rights now? What is happening in the world? The wars become big and big. The hate spread all over the world. What is the reality of human rights? What is the role of Human Rights Council as the most important body of the United Nations who seeks to observe the human rights and also to stop any kind of violation against human rights. I think the most important answer that we can say that unfortunately, that the role of Human Rights Council is very weak. I am afraid, and I think all the people who defend on human rights are so afraid from this weakness of the Human Rights Council. All the humanity around the world agreed on the values, on the principles of human rights. 
But when they talk about mechanism, how to force the countries to be committed for human rights, then they fail. They have a totally disagreement on this field. So it was a real victory when the humanity established the uh, Human Rights Council. But this victory must be real. We need implementation. We need to have a real mechanism, a real hands, a real tooth for this Human Rights Council to observe and to force the countries to implement all what we agreed in the Charter of the الإعلان العالمي لحقوق الإنسان International Charter of Declaration of the uh, of the Human Rights and also other conventions and agreement etc. So this is number one. We need to improve our mechanisms for strengthening this a very important body. And also, we have a very important body, which is International, Community, uh, International Criminal Court, which also doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. We are now talking about, and most of you was in the, in the Human Rights Council discussing about human rights, and while the International Community Court established for making sanction against, for making, for make prosecution against those who committed to the Garaim uh, the human, uh, the criminal against humanity. But tell me, how many people do that International Criminal Court persecute? Tell me, what is happening now in the, United, in the Middle East? with the dictators who kills their people every day. Tell me, what is the real mechanism of the international community of the Human Rights Council against those people who stole the money, the public money from their people and put their people under the line of poverty? So now, let's raise our voice. All of us need a very strong hand who advocate, who help, who support the people around the world who are fighting, who are struggling, who are sacrificing for freedom and dignity, democracy and rule of law. And from other hand, when we talk about also international community, their commitment to the human rights values as a community, as states, not just not as United Nations and their bodies. Unfortunately, I am as one of those people who are calling for freedom and dignity and peace. It's uh, difficult. I am so sad. This is a very simple. Because when we talk about strong countries and the countries who are calling for and freedom and dignity and values as their values as a nation, as a state. But when they deal with us, they deal with us with their interests, not with the values that they carry. So this is a very big problem. We as a people belong to this world. We as a people who belong to 21st century. 
want a new world based on peace and love and coexisting. Want a new world based on rights and equality and justice, 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 justice. Democracy and rule of law. And we will have it. We will reach to this moment. But please, to the United Nations, to the, all the states who are carrying and raising the flags of freedom and dignity, please be with the people who are sacrificing for these values. Be with them. People now are suffering a lot, a lot, a lot. People now in Middle East, in Arab Spring countries, they are in the prisons. For what? For what they are in the prisons? Just for calling for freedom. Just for calling for equality. Just for calling for new state without corruption, new state without chaos, new state without terrorists. People are dying there. So you should be with them. You should be with their value, with your values, not just their values. When we talk about totalitarian regimes, the most important or the first victims is the human rights. So we should be together to spread democracy, rule of law, and human rights all over the world. Now talking about Middle East, or talking about special, about Arab Spring countries. What is happening now? Again, there are people, youth, most of them they are youth, most of them are women, went to street again calling for new states, calling for the values that is inside the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and of all the conventions in the United uh, Nations. They are calling for new states. And they went to the street peacefully. Peacefully. They carried the flowers against all the kind of violence from the tyranny. But what happened? The people in Arab Spring when in their first step of peaceful revolution, when they stepped down Ben Ali and Mubarak and Al Qaddafi and Ali Saleh, and we hope very soon Bashar al Assad. So all of them decided to step down the ousted regime of, uh, president of Egypt and and uh, Tunisia, and Libya, and Yemen. And again, very soon, inshallah, with Bashar al-Assad. And this is just the first step of their revolution, of their will for change. But what happened after that? I'm talking about human rights, what's happened? People, again, you have to keep it. People, when they go to the street, they didn't go for chaos. They go for new States, they go for new values, justice, freedom, democracy, rule of law, peace. And they had their victory in the first step, which is step down the head of the regime. After that, as most of you know, that after every great revolution, people face counter-revolution. We faced a very ugly counter-revolution. Very, very ugly counter-revolution. In Egypt, for example, it was and is still armed coup against the legitimate ruling uh, president. And most of the people now who were struggling peacefully 
in the 25 January of revolution in, in Egypt, now most of them in the prison. The president him, himself under the threat of death penalty. And no one in the, in the international community criticized that. Is this the human right? Is this the values that Human Rights Council established for? The same thing with Syria. What is happening now in Syria? The same thing in Syria. Hundreds, thousands of people being killed by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Millions, ten millions of people been displaced and they are refugees now by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Women been raped, children. The city has been totally destroyed because of Bashar al-Assad and his regime. Now the world is screaming, is shouting, oh my God, there is refugees, there is refugees. Why you were silenced when Bashar al-Assad killed the people? Six months, Syrian people. Six months, six months. Syrian people were, was like me, carrying the flowers, just flowers, against all the violation of Bashar al-Assad. And no one listened to them. No one listened to them. And now they, t say, they, say, they, 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 they said that Syria is facing ISIS. ISIS is the result of Bashar al-Assad. ISIS is the result of, this, of the silence of the international community against all the kind of violation from Bashar al-Assad. ISIS is the enemy of Arab Spring. As well as Bashar al-Assad. ISIS is killing Muslims people, is killing revolutionary people more than anyone else. More anyone else. Just see the map of ISIS. Where is ISIS now in Syria? At the land of the people, the, of the revolutionary people, not at the land of Bashar al-Assad. So, with your silence, the extremism will e exist. With your silence, the tyranny will have more power to kill people and to create the extremism and to create the terrorists to kill the dreams of people and also to threat you as a state. So they use Al-Qaeda, they use ISIS to kill the people who are against them and also to threat the West, to make you afraid from the change. Don't believe the tyranny. Don't believe them. That terrorism is the result of tyranny. That terrorism is the result of injustice. That terrorism is the result of the absence of good governance. That terrorism is the result of the absence of, the absence of development. If we want, all of us, to stop terrorism, because this is our battle, is the battle of all humanity. We should to stop the tyranny at the first thing. Second, we should spread the rule of law. Third, we should spread the development. The development. And fourth, we should make, we should support the people who are calling for the religion reforms. So it's, it's a comprehensive solution. <laughs> it doesn't come from throwing the bullets. No, it's a real, it needs real solution, big solution. Remember, every dictator is a terrorist and every terrorist is a dictator. 
both of them feed each other. And both of them take from each other all the reason of being alive. Third, in my country, Yemen, what is happening now in Yemen? The same story of Arab Spring. People, a great people, a great nation. They have more than 70 million pieces of weapons. They decided in 2011 to throw them in their tribes. They go, went to the street with flowers, just flowers, just singing, peaceful, peaceful, our revolution is peaceful. Women and men, millions of, of women, or millions of people was in the street just carrying flowers against all the kind of violation from the ousted president Ali Saleh. And we as Yemenis give the world a big and a good symbol, example of how the nation when want to change, they really change. They First, the first victory that Yemeni's people did is that they use the peaceful way for making change. And it was 100 percentage of revolution, 100. If you compare with any revolution, even in the Arab Spring, Yemen, country, Yemen state has 100, had 100 per, 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 uh, percent of peaceful revolution. Yemeni people didn't kill any soldier. Yemeni people didn't attack any institutions of the government. Yemeni people didn't attack even any offices of the ruling party. Even it, most of them was, uh, some of them was in the squares of the demonstrators. But they didn't. Because of that, Yemeni people went peacefully in the first step of their peaceful revolution on 20. 1 November of 2011, when the ousted President Ali Saleh signed his resign. So we did a great peaceful revolution, and we make a great victory in the first step of the revolution, which is step down the, the, the head of the, of the state, which is, which is the corrupted and the uh, uh, dictator, which is Ali Abdullah Saleh. This is number one. Number two, in the, in the transitional period, Yemeni people entered to the intertransitional period with peaceful myth method. Also completely peaceful method with the sponsorship of the, of the international community. With the tolerance, with all the values, the, the, all the values that people of Yemen carry in their peaceful revolution. Because of that, we as Yemeni entered, يعني, uh, let the ruling party that we made revolution against to participate in, the, in, the, in leading the transitional period. We made a very success story in the national dialogue. About, about one year, all Yemeni parties was in one, on, in one table, discussing everything, discussing everything about Yemen, about the future of Yemen, even the constitution, and even this dialogue was with the partnership of ousted president Ali Saleh, his alliance, not himself, but his alliance, and also with militia of Al Houthi. And we did a great national dialogue outcomes. We, after that, started, wrote the constitution with them. But finally, but suddenly, the coup happened. Against all these things, the coup from the Nazist, from the fascist, militia of Al Houthi, with alliance with ousted President Ali Saleh, and with unfortunately support from the regime of Iran, who want to occupy Yemen to, as a gate to occupy all Arab Peninsula. Now we face very ugly war after a very peaceful yani, transitional period. Very ugly war. 
we now facing a very ugly counter-revolution, led by militia Houthi, led by ousted President Ali Saleh, and by supporting with Iran, unfortunately. But as you know, every great revolution followed by counter-revolution. But at the end, who win? The people. We are the people who will win, and we are the people who will create a new state that will be a good member of the world, and we will be one nation as a humanity who work with each other, love each other, and make this world better without any tyranny and any corruption. Thank you so much. Tawakul, you have shown us uh, a powerful path. You've called on us to fill the silence, to fill the silence with accountability for those with the power to betray rights. You've called on us to seek justice for those denied rights, to fill the silence with solidarity with those who are deprived of rights. You've called on us to seek values, first and foremost, over interests, and powerfully to carry flowers in front of guns. We could not ask for a more powerful and appropriate pathway to our final speaker. And it is with great pleasure and great honour that I give the floor to someone who knows so well the power of flowers over guns, his holiness. Dear brothers, sisters, uh, indeed, uh, great honor to speak in front of Honorable Lord. Women of the Lord, and uh, another, let's say, cousin <laughs> representative, so another semi noble Lord. <laughs> so, and then, in front of these, uh, I think, people who have some directly or indirectly some connection with this field. So then, I very much appreciate organizer. Uh, the officials from the United States, they said, you uh, organized this opportunity. Thank you very much. Ka. Canada. Oh, Canada also. <laughs> no. So also I want to thank you also create to some people some problem. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now indeed, uh, to the sort of presentation, uh, you really very moving, very moving. Uh, I'm just one of some sort of single human being out of seven billion human beings. We are talking about the future of humanity. So no matter how sort of small voice, this is very, very essential. Uh, sometimes people have the feeling, oh, well, okay, going on continuously. I think that kind of sort of uh, attitude is wrong. A lot of problem. Uh, now I am 
nearly 81 year old. I born 1935. Soon, Sino Japanese conflict start, and also Second World Wars. So also, also you see. Uh, the cause of Second World War also is growing like that. Then, uh, Second World War, Korean War, uh, immense sort of civil war in China, the Vienna War, so still today, a lot of people kill him. Now, it is very important. We have to think uh, what was wrong and what we are lacking. 20th century, a lot of killing. Uh, I think some historians say over 200 million people killed through war. And also two nuclear weapon used on human beings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So immense sort of violence uh, if brought some new shape of the world better world, then some people uh, may say the justification of that immense violence. But that's not the case. As a matter of fact, beginning of this 21st century, although not such a Second World War or this sort of large-scale war, but pockets, pockets, continuously, you see, killing, continuously. This, I feel, symptom of past mistake and our negligence. So when we talk about human right, uh, human right violation, uh, now time come. We have to think, what are the causes of these violations? The people create immense suffering to others. This is also human being. They also want peaceful life. But, you see, they are way of thinking. Too much short-sighted. Uh, and I think narrow-minded. Now time come to think. How to change that? Since, see, uh, I said, uh, I have many friends among the scientists, educationists, and spiritual practitioner, and ordinary people. So we have sort of clear sort of conclusion. You see, basic human, uh, yes, conclusion is, this is our way of life, way of thinking, uh, is, I think, too much materialistic way. Uh, so now that, in matters, see, there's no feeling of pains and pleasure. Just, you see, gain more money, more power like that. Uh, now we have to think, you see, any of our action, how much, how much create pains and sadness, any action which create sadness, pains, that we must avoid. So then human rights violation is one cause. And I think worst kind of human rights 
violation is war, killing, and of course exploitation, and also, you see, gap rich and poor, and also corruptions. So, a lot of different form of human rights violations there. Who creates these violence by human being? Not other animals. I think like tiger looks very terrible, but they are not causing <laughs> this <laughs> human rights violation. <laughs> <laughs> they kill maybe one or two human beings, uh, but very limited. <laughs> so ultimately, we created these, how should they, uh, these sort of suffering, human rights violation. Now, these are also the action causing other sort of suffering, ultimately related with motivation. Motivation combined with wisdom and compassion, and then action always bring positive. Any action motivated by anger, hatred, fear, then any action, no matter how sort of uh, superficially peace, but ultimately bring suffering. So now the question is, what is wrong? Now here I want to say, basic human nature is more compassionate, positive, Some scientists now investigate basic, what is basic human nature. They carried sort of experiment to infant child before speech develop, very young, uh, few months old. Cartoon, which you see, two children. Show. Ah. Which show? Uh, cartoon show. I mean, I mean, cartoon which two children play together with smile. When that cartoon show that infant child, child express smile. Another cartoon, two children humming each other, negative. Face, face expression. When that garden show to that child, child, little bit sort of, I say the unhappy sort of expression. And then more important, according scientific sort of some medical scientist, they say, constant fear, constant anger, hatred actually eating our immune system. So, other hand, more calm mind, more peaceful mind, which we call healthy mind. You see that? Very important for our health, physical health. Then, of course, according to our common experience. We all, including those people who create a lot of human rights, the violation of human rights, these also come from mother. <laughs> Not come from raw or tiger. <laughs> these also come from the mother. They also nurtured by mother's milk. Uh, they received Maximum affection from their parent, particularly from their mother. They also very much appreciate this is mother's affection. And actually, we've grown up with mother's milk. That is a symbol of affection. So all seven million human beings come that way. So when we think these, these, these points, then... Uh, we really feel our ah, basic human nature is compassion, 
positive. So there is possibility, make effort. If basic human nature is negative, then no use, make effort. <laughs> then perhaps alcohol, <laughs> sleep. <laughs> so since basic human nature is more positive, uh, that's on the basis of scriptures, but on the basis of a scientific finding. So they prove that. So therefore, now it is really worthwhile. Oh, how to sort of how to make effort. How, how to make effort. <coughs> now the problem, you know, we seven billion human beings. We all have that potential. Yeah. But now, frankly speaking, education. Our education system, not adequate, something lacking. So children at young age, they don't care what other children sort of, what is the background, what is their faith, what is their nationality, whether rich or poor, or influential family or not. They don't care. So long, children showing smile, Play together, they feel very happy. Then, in education field, not talking about these basic values. So, existing education system is something lacking. So, some with, with some with some scientist and some educationist and some thinkers, and some social workers. Now we already committed, you see, making uh, some research how to put in education system about education or uh, inner value. All major religious tradition, you see, promoting basic human value. That's warm-heartedness compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, these things. Uh, but then, out of seven billion human beings, over one billion non-believer, then among about six billion believers, there are a little corrupted believers also there. <laughs> some, of, some of the believers themselves create more problems. Isn't it? <laughs> so now, we have to think. See, the effective way uh, to educate human beings, uh, not relying on religious sort of concept, but simply uh, basis based on scientific findings and our common experience and common sense. So, they, we are so trying to try because of the invest, because of, uh, making efforts, uh, making effort you see, to make draft sort of for secular education. When I use the word secular, according to Indian understanding, yeah. uh, in the West, is some of my friend. When I say secular, they feel secular means a little bit disrespect to religion. And some even should, uh, f have the f view or feeling secular is secular and atheism some connection. This is not the case in India's understanding generally. India's constitution itself based on secular. So not at all any religion or disrespect religion. India is a religious minded nation. And who drafting these constitutions, very religious minded like late Rajendra Prasad, very religious minded people. According to Indian understanding, so secular means respect all religions and also uh, respect non-believer. Although nowadays, you see, within in India also, you see uh, different interpretation about the meaning of 
uh, secularism. Mm. So uh, finally, I think we have to go to uh, Oxford English professors. <laughs> what is the real meaning of secular? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, now I feel uh, not not just me. You see, as a result of discussion with you see people of various different background, also the common concern is how to create a happy humanity, happy century. Then ultimately, uh, uh, we all agree education, existing education system is not adequate. It is too much because of the oriented material value. Usually, you see, we just totally rely about moral ethics on religion. That now not cover uh, 7 billion human beings. So, therefore, uh, that's uh, our report. Now we are thinking, we are trying to create uh, as the, a curriculum which can fit in secular education field. And now in America, we already sort of working at some university, uh, also you see, carrying some sort of experiment. And then also, uh, some cities in America, they already, you see, uh, developed the very name of the city is uh, City of Kindness, City of Compassion. I think these, I think quite some sort of uh, uh, method, you see, to remind people importance of loving kindness, these things. And then uh, some occasion, when I, I visited, you see, the city of kindness, you say, I half joke, you say, I mentioned with beautiful name, city of kindness, city of compassion. But within the city, people remain too much stress, too much jealousy, too much sorority, greed, and uh, suspicion, anger. Uh, with that beautiful name, People in that city now should develop, should have inner peace. So that, not through prayer. I'm Buddhist, Buddhist monk. In my daily practice, uh, including prayer. But I'm quite skeptical. Through prayer, bring world peace, I don't think. One, one occasion, in Hiroshima, Hiroshima, some Nobel laureates, hmm, uh, the other Nobel laureate, and also some Japanese sort of leaders at Hiroshima. You see, they also, you see, uh, as they mentioned, uh, with uh, God's blessing, or Buddha's blessing, uh, we may achieve peace. Uh, peace, world peace. Then, at the end, my turn. I frankly, you see, express, oh, through prayer, through blessing, world peace, I feel difficult. <laughs> so peace must create through action, not prayer. So now, you see, in order to carry uh, peaceful action, we need Enthusiasm here. Enthusiasm need s s strong self-confidence in a positive way. These troublemakers also self-confidence <laughs> with anger, with hatred. So they don't care what others do, uh, opinions. Uh, they don't care about our criticism. <laughs> <laughs> and even the United Nations sort of some resolution, they don't care. Uh -oh. So now we have to deal the fundamental level. Frankly speaking, our generation, not much hope. <laughs> the, our hope, future generation, if we start now, 
the education something more holistic. Education about so physical health, that means material values provide us physical comfort. Then that equally, that education also, you see, teach us how to create healthy mind. So sometimes I usually used to describe hygiene of physical, similarly hygiene of emotion. Now that's now, uh, as an academic subject, not a religious matter. I think now, within a few years, I think within, within this year, I think uh, some sort of draft, first draft, first draft, I think may materialize. In India also, you see, we are working. In America also, you see, working. So uh, then, hopefully, you see, few school carry this sort of what's the uh, curriculum, then see what's the result after a few years. If something quite significant is a positive result, then can also extend more. Then eventually, United Nations can pass the resolution. <laughs> so, so that's my, uh, wherever now, I, I, I give a talk, I always talk talking these things. Now, conclusion is, we, our generation, we witness so much sort of suffering. Uh, now we have to think, we have our duty to tell younger generation, if present condition remain continuously, they also will suffer. This 21st century also become century of suffering, century of bloodshed. Now the younger, younger generation's responsibility to create a better world, happier world. At least this 21st century, in spite of some beginning, some violence there, but later part of the 21st century should be century of peace. So I think there is basic human nature is positive through scientific research. So then there is real hope. Real hope. This is a result my lifetime will not see. Perhaps my life, another 15 years or 10 years, 15 years, uh, then I will say bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, uh, while you see, we gain some experience, last over 80 years, now this is a must share with people and let them make effort, let them think new vision, new effort. That's all, thank you. His Holiness has really blessed us in so many ways by his example, by his instruction and by this challenge to look to the generations that come after us. And I just wanted to put a, a question to the panel while you're thinking of questions that you may wish to also suggest to the panel and we will come to that. But I think many of us would be wondering, each of you has had your rights violated. Each of you has been subjected to grave injustice without recourse, which means each of you has chosen to walk away from hate, to walk away from fear, to walk away from revenge. How have you done that? <laughs> How have you chosen a path of peace and of tolerance? and acceptance, and what would you want to say to people who are very tempted to use their grave in sense of grave injustice to become an instrument for hate, to become a reason or an excuse for violence? How did you not do that? Hi, 
How did we do that? <laughs> because we believe that the most effective way to win, to have victory, is to use nonviolence. I believe that because of peaceful revolution, we could step down Ali Saleh. And because of peaceful revolution, we could step down Hasni Mubarak and Ben Ali. How did we do that without feeling the fears? Yeah. Because we started dream. Because our dream calling us for a new state without dictatorism and without corruption and without terrorism. Because of our generation, the second generation, I don't want the second generation to suffer like, like what I suffer. I did that for my kids, for all the people of my nation, for all the people of Arab nation, for all the people of the world. I've been in the prison many times. I've been threatened many times. And now I am in exile after a great peaceful revolution. We believe on our peaceful method. And we believe on our dream. And we believe on the point that we will reach. We will win in the end. But please, we did all what we can for the peaceful revolution. We did, and we are now still struggling for this moment, for returning the, 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 the peaceful again. But please, be with us. Be with people. Work for people who are struggling peacefully. Again and again, we will not give up. This is the method that we, which we create. And this is the dream that we will reach to. But how much the price we will pay. The freedom has a very big price. And your grandma and father and grandfather knows that very well. You as the international community and as the ad advanced country didn't reach to this moment without the sacrifice of your grandmother and grandfather. So we are the founder of our great nation, of the new nation. So please, you should decide how much the price will be. At the end, we will win as your grandfather and your grandmother win. And we will create the democracy and prosperity and good governance in our, in our countries. But again, international community, Human Rights Council, all our hands who, support, who must support has to be serious on being with people. Be with people, work for people, and the price will be less than it will be. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Leila, it's uh, incredibly tempting to feel hate and contempt for those who have treated you with such yeah. disregard for your dignity. Yeah, some, some, sometimes when uh, I just came out from the Revolutionary Code defending my you know, clients, and I was really just you know, crying outside the courtroom because I was, I just feel so humiliate, humiliated in the courtroom when I was just facing the judge, facing the security force, and the security forces in the court. And I, but I, I tried to be, you know, very powerful in the court when defending my clients, but really when I came, up, came out and just sit in the street and cry and then just go home. But the things that, you know, I always try to find a common things between myself and the judge who was, you know, there in the power. As His Holiness said that there are also human beings. 
And then we need to, I find it really, find the common things, because for instance, in the case of women, I always try to reach a judge and said, imagine, this is your, do your own daughter, this is your mother or whatever, you know, I never mention about your wife, because sometimes maybe they had problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, this is maybe your own daughter, you know. And then, so, actually, I had some, uh, you know, cases that I win in the Revolutionary Court when they said, okay, maybe they leave these young students go free. Um, but, and the other example, we changed so many, some laws, discriminatory laws, by peaceful demonstration and peaceful way. For instance, one case, there was a case of Ariane Golshani, a, you know, a girl was killed. And then uh, we were arguing about the case of custody. And at that time, we invited crowd to a, a ceremony. And Dr. Abadi actually started uh, when she talked, and we, proper, we prepared uh, white flowers. We asked the crowd to just uh, spread the flowers in the street. And then in a moment, the whole street was full of flight flowers. And the image of this you know, peaceful act reached the media. And after, you know, just but by our efforts and also continuation, after some years, we just succeed to change the uh, custody law in favor of children. Uh, so I think when you believe in your path, when you believe in the way that you want to carry, you always, you know, stick to be, you know, to peaceful way, and you want to be calm, and you want to inspire other person. You don't want to be, you, we are against violence. We don't want to create more violence. So I think this is the things that, you know, give us courage Beautiful. to carry Thank on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nella. How can we make of love and tolerance uh, a new STI? a socially transmitted infection. <laughs> How can we spread love and tolerance as if it were a virus? What can we do to replace hate with compassion? As I mentioned earlier, uh, when we are very young, uh, we don't make distinction uh, so long. You see, showing smile. So now education, Although it's all religion, you see, talking, you see, uh, entire human being, uh, spiritual brothers, sisters. Uh, and Buddhist, uh, we usually call entire mother sending me. Word very nice. But I want Buddhists also some troublemaker there. <laughs> So now, you see, these words are uh, not, not effect in our emotions. So now we need systematic education. Then, uh, with reason, with sort of evidence, right? Conviction. Evidence, right? With evidence through scientific research. You see, we can change, or we can maintain the young children's sort of warm-heartedness when they uh, grown up. Still, you see, that remain uh, fresh. Now we have this. Uh, I think uh, at the by, uh, at the young age, you see, the loving kindness nature there. That is mainly biological. Because we are social animal. Uh, then we grown up uh, gradually. You see that biological, biologically, you see, developed that sort of loving kindness. Basically, limited, without backing our uh, intelligence. So now, education field is a further sort of explanation. These are basic human value. Oh, in order, in order to carry happy human being, you need these things, reasons such, 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 oh, A, such, B, C, such. You see, we have plenty of reasons. So then, that, that biological factor, affection, compassion, is biased, only related towards friends. 
Now we have this sort of ability use our intelligence. Then we can ex uh, uh, extend. Uh, extend, you see, that uh, compassionate sort of attitude towards uh, entire sentient being. Uh, so, including your enemy. Now, here we make a distinction. Action, actor. As far as your enemy is concerned, the action is harmful. So, sometimes we need to take countermeasure. But as far as the actor is concerned, still human brothers and sisters. So, they also deserve our love, respect. So, that with help of intelligence, you see, we can develop that kind of unbiased love, loving kindness. So that, I think, through education, we can do. I think through education, hatred also sometimes increasing. Uh, through education, you see, too much sort of emphasis, we and the they increase through education. So another way, through education, we can build, we can develop entire human being is part of we, 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 part of us. We are same human being. Now, particularly today's world, in economy field or environment issue, all, you see, uh, East, I mean, uh, East <coughs> depend on West, West depend East, Northern world depend Southern world, Southern world depend North. That's the today's reality. Unlike, I think, a few centuries ago, a European, particularly Swiss, you are completely independent. <laughs> you see, no need sort of cooperation with other country. I think that spirit still carry here. <laughs> you Swiss, uh, you, lo <laughs> the, you love Swiss Frank. <laughs> Rather, I think, Euro. Euro. <laughs> like that. <laughs> So, so therefore, you see, in the ancient time, yes, each community, more or less self-sufficient. No need cooperation. No need sort of, because of the interdependent sort of situation or interconnectedness. Now today's world, heavily interconnected. Many articles you, you daily use, made in China, made in India, or some other countries, uh, like that. So that's today's world. And then you see the, uh, the climate sort of, because of the global, uh, global warming. Now these, they don't care national boundary or religious boundary. With several million human beings, you see, facing same problem. I think anyway, global warming and global economy, I think, teach us you should act as a one humanity. Our survival actually depends on sense of oneness of humanity. If we carry sense of oneness of humanity and accordingly practice, then our world will be Happier world. So one occasion I met some Cuban refugee, very religious minded, Catholic, very religious minded. Uh, we just talk refugee. You know. So they a little bit sort of resented to uh, Fidel Castro. So they told me in daily in church when they pray to God. Please bring Fidel Castro to heaven. Sooner the better. <laughs> this is nice. Not sort of ill feeling. Pray, uh, go to, uh, should, should bring to heaven. Uh, but while well, he created a lot of problems, so sooner the better. <laughs> so I think if basic human, human nature is negative, then only thing is pray to God, bring entire humanity, go to heaven. <laughs> so 
So I think according believer, yes, we created by God, Allah. God, Allah, yes. infinite love. Oh, so we are son or daughter of infinite love. So that really brings powerful message uh, to, to create enthusiasm, to practice love, forgiveness. Love is not word, action. While you're talking love, 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 action, go that, like that, that is hypocrisy. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> we, we Buddhists uh, we always say, oh, transcendent being, transcendent being. But in actual action, it's just self centered, or me, 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 me. That's hypocrisy. It's no use. So, so in any way, so in any way, I think, uh, the basically, I think the, according to my own experience, when I heard basic human nature is positive, compassionate, then I really develop conviction. Oh, uh, and also, you see, confirmed our own experience when we look children, they don't care about the other children's background, they work together. One time in Switzerland, the uh, pathology there, children from Israeli, some place name, like that, they play together. That's a hope of future. You see, you, we too much sort of make kasoda. We Actually, most of the problem which we are facing is we too much emphasis importance of secondary level of differences. The ultimate solution is since this problem, man-made problem, man-made, uh, not necessarily exclude women. Some, <laughs> so, so, some women, some women quite troublesome. <laughs> so, so generally, you see, we call man-made problem. Now, on these. You see, oh, so we too much emphasis, we and they, on the basis of nationality, religious faith, and within same faith, same, same sort of nation, rich and poor, and educated, uneducated, and in India, the caste system, very bad. All these problems, you see, because we too much emphasis on secondary level of differences. Now, only sort of solution to minimize these things, we have to go fundamental level, we are same human being. Seven billion human being, same way born, same way die. Each of us have the right to achieve happy life. So, many of the problem which essentially we created then there's no reason. Everyone want a happy life. But then too much emphasis, we and they, we de deliberately created problem to other. So ultimately, that problem also causing your own sort of problem, like that. So these are short-sighted, not thinking holistic, a lack of sense of oneness of humanity and oneness of the whole world. We have to act as a one community, one human community, human family. In ancient time, impossible. Now, modern time, through education, we can do that. That's all. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I know that many of uh, us are time short at, at this stage, but I would like to just give a chance for one or two questions uh, before uh, we lose our distinguished panellists to their other demands. Yes, please. So please introduce yourself. Uh, please identify where you're from and uh, just a question rather than a comment, please. Thank you. My name is Ibrahim. I, am, uh, I was the former ambassador of Yemen to the UN in Geneva. Uh, Madam Chair, you were describing tawakkul as in many uh, called in Yemen. 
uh, all of us, we describe her as a pioneer of new history Thank you, in Yemen. And she's yeah. the role model in not only for women, uh, for men also, including myself. Uh, my question to her now, uh, the uh, violation of human rights in Yemen caused by the Houthis and Saleh is a huge. It's ever been in Yemen and where else. Now, what is next? What is your offer? And what is your plan as a civil society, cooperation with others as human rights activists in sending these criminals to international courts? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Another question, perhaps, on this side? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Just introduce yourself and a question only. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Jonathan Parianti, uh, founder of uh, OU.com, the social network for social good. Uh, thank you very much for all the great energy that you have shared with us. Uh, I think we have a panel and we have as well, you know, an audience that represents the diversity of mankind. And, and that is, you know, like a great source of hope. My question for uh, all of you is we are living in a capitalism system. We are living in a system where we put, you know, at the forefront the run for accumulation of assets, of goods. Maybe, you know, when we look at the way the system works, we can see and we can feel that it has to evolve. We just launched two weeks ago the first global social currency to support economic inclusiveness all over the world. My question would be, to what extent do you feel and do you maybe foresee that bringing economic inclusiveness to support education, to support innovation, to support the way to bring gender equality and give a chance to all human beings would might be, you know, like a way to find that solution to greater good? Thank you very much indeed. And perhaps one final question. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. My name is Serena Krishan. I'm a PhD student at the Institute. I was wondering whether each of you could uh, address the students present in this room and also watching online. Do you have specific words of advice or maybe guidance as we embark on a career on which I'm sure most of us will hope to actually improve the lives of others, even if it's just one person that we can actually help? Thank you. Beautiful question. Thank you for it. And because it was so excellent, I'm going to give someone else a chance to ask. <laughs> Just one more question. This really now. <laughs> Just one here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. I will be so brief. La Dugor Guiwadudu, je suis journaliste auprès des Nations Unies à Genève et responsable de Continent Premier Point uh, This is a question addressed to the Dalai Lama. Uh, what do you think that the situation gonna be bad right now in Tibet regarding the new wave we have in China? And you talk about empathy. Do you think that this speech we received very well will go also to the hearts of the politicians we have here a lot of ambassadors, but also to the responsible of the international enterprises in the world. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much indeed. Tabakola, I know you have to go, so I'm going to give you first opportunity to respond to uh, uh, the questions that you've heard, and thank you very much. I will try to sit with you, but I have another conference, sorry for that. Um, uh, regarding to the first question, um, we have a peaceful solution, and we call always for peaceful solution. But by the way, when we are calling for peaceful solution, and we are so insisting on this field, I am to totally belong to this field, peaceful solution, peaceful struggle. But always there is another kind of struggle who are against the violence. Remember that the revolution, the Arab Spring Revolution was peaceful, and still, peaceful, but what happened, the counter-revolution was very violent. So they, 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 you know, they announced the war against, against you know, the peaceful uh, revolution. So it's very important to all of us 
has to work to don't make the tyranny to push people to go to the violence. This is a very important. But also me as Tawakkul Karman, as a peaceful struggle, and I believe totally with nonviolence, but I can't, I can't stay against a go, uh, those yeah, people yeah. who tried to defend their lands from the occupation. This is a very important thing. From other hand, what is my my solution and the, the, the initiative from me and from all the people who, are, who believe to tell you on non-violent. We always call for ceasefire, immediate ceasefire in parallel, in parallel with militia of Al Houthi and Ali Saleh has to withdraw from the cities. It's very important has to hand over their weapons to the legitimate authority, to the President Hadi and its government. The militia of Al Houthi has to, has to uh, transfer themselves to be political party. Then we have to make transitional justice that guarantee no, no revenge and also to guarantee also to don't repeat this gr crime. Then we have to go to have vote or referendum for the constitution, for the new constitution of Yemeni who they wrote, and then the election. So we are calling, when we put solution, it's comprehensive solution. Ceasefire with withdraw from all the cities that they occupied. They have to hand over the weapons because it must important, there is no peace if there is any militia has weapons. The state must be the only one who has the right to have the weapons. So again, and this is for the ambassadors who are working here for the, this is our peaceful initiative. Again, ceasefire and the militia of Al Houthi and Ali Saleh has to withdraw from all the cities that they occupied in Yemen. They have to hand over all the weapons that they take and that they have to the legitimate uh, uh, authority. Third, they have to transfer to be political party. No, any, any party has, any group doesn't have any right to use violence to ta to, for, for taking any kind of their demands and, and rights. Fourth, we have to make transitional justice that guarantee that this crime will not repeat, and also that guarantee there is no revenge, that guarantee tolerance and you know, and you know, between and coexistence with the, all the people. Fourth, which is very important, making making a referendum for the constitution that yeah, many people did. As I told you, we did a sexist story, and they made coup against everything. So to the point, we have constitution, we have to make a referendum on it, then make the uh, election. This is regarding the first question. Second question, with all this chaos, I am so optimistic. I don't care about all this chaos because this chaos is creating by the tyranny, by the regimes that we uh, step down them. Created and it's a result of them. So I am so optimistic of the nation of Arab, Arab Spring that they will reach to their, to their you know, to their uh, uh, dream and their goals. And I am so optimistic if all over the world, we are now in the new world, we are now in the globalization, we are now live in a very small village, in a very small house. So we are now live and carry a new identity, new, really, this is the reality. And especially the youth knows that, students know that very much. We are now have a new identity, which is humanity. This is our new identity. And our new state is this, Earth. So this is our thing. So I am so optimistic. I am so confident with the future. The future will be very, very happy 
the future will be very, very strong, will be very, very with the people around all over the world who are seeking, who are struggling, who are sacrificing for freedom and justice, who are sacrificing for making this world better. So don't worry. Don't worry. There is no voice stronger than the voice of al-haq, of the truth, Thank of the so belief, of you. the will, of the freedom. Thank you so much. Layla, please. I, if I'm not wrong, one of the questions was the economy. To yes, exactly. Human rights. I think this, this, is, this is very important because, you know, economic rights is one of the human rights. And then people are poor and, under, you know, not developed. So uh, they are not asking for much rights. And one of my critics to all, to many human rights organi organizations is that they are mainly focused on political rights and civil rights. Mm -hmm. They are completely ignored economic rights. And we do have cases of uh, economic, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the most uh, problem of some villages or, or some, uh, you know, rural area in Iran uh, that they are facing this kind of problem. And if they have work and if they can survive, they are not doing, uh, you know, many, I, I, I can't say the violation of human rights will be reduced in that region. For instance, I can bring you an example. We have um, border couriers, for instance, in Kurdistan of Iran. Uh, because they don't have, they, their farms actually is contaminated by landmines. So they cannot do the farming. Some of these people are for, you know, for doing their life, for uh, earning money. They are going to other countries to sm bring, uh, you know, things and uh, like a, a smuggler, they are calling. But uh, there is it's a very complicated issue. But they put their life in danger because they will be shot dead by the government as well. Um, and also for the case of women, I think there is a um, quite a co a connection. If women empowered, if they're economically empowered, they have their work themselves and they can talk, they can speak out about themselves. Because in many cases, when I talk with women and they, they, are, they are suffering abuse in their families, in their homes, but they cannot leave that home because they don't have any place to go. They don't have any money to really rely on. They need to stick to that husband which is abusing them because they are not economically independent. So to creating jobs for these you know, people, for these women, I think is a way that we can educate them, we can empower them, that they can speak out about their, their uh, situation. And one thing that is only uh, undermine many you know, these traditional and social things in Iranian society is that women now are educated, they are making money, they are economically empowered. Uh, so this is going to be like threat uh, to the Islamic government because they don't want women to be so, so powerful. Uh, so I think it's very important to create jobs, to you know, pay more attention actually to economic rights because it's a, it's, it's, it's a key actually. And development is one of the things that we needed in, uh, mid, in the Middle East and uh, you know, that part of the world. Thank you very much, Leila. His Holiness. Second part. Oh. Yeah, the second part. I, I want. The second part. Or the empathy. Yeah, that's the yeah. There are many diplomats. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. The challenge of t was made to diplomats as oh. to what their plans are. That's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> if you think long run uh, and think more about humanity, then these points is something relevant. And if you consider uh, the Kasota, immediate university, uh, your work, then not much relevant. <laughs> so up to you. <laughs> I think the diplomats, you see, when you retired your work, more time to think, then you see, uh, these are my ideas, this is my talk. You see, you may feel more interesting uh, to Kasota. 
Jag kan säga det. Ja, samtidigt. To think deep, deeper about ja. it. Mm. Then the first part about Tibet. Uh, the problem between China and Tibet is not new. For over a thousand years, sometimes very friendly. And also, you see, the 7th century, 8th century, 9th century, through marriage, the Chinese princess and Tibetan city prince or emperor is marriage, very, very close relations. Uh, then, after all, you see, China, historically, Buddhist country. Now, today, over 400 million Buddhist population. Many of these Chinese Buddhists, you see, they really, you see, eager to follow uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition because they uh, realize, you see, we, uh, Buddhism, which we kept, you see, with a lot of effort for study, 20, 30 years rigorous study. So, knowledge is concerned about Buddhism in general, particularly the Sanskrit tradition. I think I can say, I think the complete and knowledge with depth, I think only available among Tibetan Buddhist uh, practitioner. No one else. Very clear. Now more and more the Chinese and some other Buddhists also now showing interest like that. Uh, one occasion, I was in Japan. This is one uh, great scholar and great abbot. You see, since many years, we become very close friend. Then, one day, he told me, uh, we Japanese Buddhists also used to recite some same sort of text. Uh, we also recite that. We, everybody recite that text, but without knowing the meaning. <laughs> so then he told me, your explanation is very, very helpful. <laughs> uh, so then many Buddhist practitioners, you see, they have the sort of uh, among Japanese and also the Chinese uh, old type. And now in the, the, some, you see, the, the West also, some people say, oh, meditation, thoughtlessness, uh, just meditate. Uh, without study, uh, uh, through that practice, uh, they believe can achieve Buddhahood. So if may I say so, the while making the uh, method to achieve Buddhahood, just thoughtless, and then there is danger, the Buddhahood also without mind. <laughs> That's not Buddha. <laughs> Buddha means enlightened. All ignorance completely eliminated. So the method to achieve that, also you see, you have to make effort to, get, to eliminate your ignorance. The only, like darkness, the, there's no other way except light come, then dark, darkness go. Oh. Similarly, mental level, darkness, ignorance, only can eliminate by knowledge, wisdom. So wisdom, knowledge, through study, through contemplation, where? Contemplation. Uh, contemplation. And we call vipassana, the uh, analytical meditation. Analytical meditation is much more powerful than single-pointed meditation. Of course, a uh, little bit difficult, a little bit harder. You need a lot of study like that. So, so the many, many Chinese now, now begin. Uh, oh, I, I think many, you see, they're really receiving some teaching from some Tibetan. And now, the last few years, the number of Chinese from mainland China they come to 
uh, see me and uh, sort of getting some sort of lecture or explanation from me. Then, so therefore, now present difficulties is, I think, due to some handful hardliner sort of thinking. Uh, Chinese people, wonderful people, uh, two centuries or close sort of friend like that. And then, furthermore, we are not seeking separation. Historically, 7th century, 8th century, 9th century, uh, according the Columbia University. Columbia University. Uh, some experts, some sort of historian, professors, you see, carry some research. Last year, they published one book. They mentioned 7th, 8th, 9th century, three powerful empires. Uh, Chinese Empire, Mongol Empire, Tibetan Empire. Uh, then they say, they concluded, Chinese Empire mainly sort of emphasis importance of political matter. The Mongol Empire emphasis military power. The Tibetan Empire emphasis on Buddhism, like that. So past is past uh, history. Now we, look, we are looking forward, future. I always admire the spirit of European Union. A different sovereign state for common interest. You see, I admire the Deutschland people. You see, the Deutsch mark, quite kasuta, kasuri. Quite important. Quite kasuta. Valuable. Quite valuable. But you see, they are willing to accept Euro. <laughs> Italy, kasati uh, means lira. Not much sort of weight. This <laughs> is so easy to join. <laughs> so, so in any way, you see, the, I think spirit of European Union. I really admire uh, General de Gaulle and Adenauer during wartime, enemy. But then, thinking, wider perspective, the Union. Uh, I think through generations remain enemy attitude, one another. One of my tutor, Professor Von Vesica, now no, no longer. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, his, uh, his own age, I think then, around 80 like that, now no longer. Once he told me, when he was young, Every German eye, French is their enemy. Similarly, French eye, German is their enemy. But that kind of attitude completely changed. Uh, so that's the way. So once you see uh, each other, it's a very negative attitude. But then looking, look, the, the new reality and future. Uh, no use to keep that kind of sort of or say the negative attitude. So I pray between China and Japan also I think better, you see, they are never uh, remain friendly, friend with trust is much better. Sometimes the Chinese uh, sort of officials reminds repeatedly some Japanese atrocity during wartime. Past to past. This is no benefit. I think that kind of propaganda is educate people, keep more revenge feeling towards the Japanese. These are short sighted. No use. Uh, so now, like this, you see the handful hardliner. See, they are thinking sometimes, you see, a little bit, little bit strange. Sometimes I jokingly telling. Uh, Lunch time, I mentioned, you know, the, the human brain, one part of human brain is a, usually you should develop common sense. Now, some of these hardliner, that part of brain is missing. <laughs> so they are not thinking realistically. 
just the Sephardis sort of line which carried in, I think, 30, 40 years ago. That just, just like tape recorder. Just repeat, 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 repeat that. Time changed. Number of Chinese really respected Tibetan culture, Tibetan Buddhist knowledge. And you see, develop close relation, uh, not negative way, that immense benefit to Chinese brothers, sisters, at least those Buddhist. And China really need culture of nonviolence, culture of truth, culture of compassion. China, immense corruption due to lack of moral principle, which based on rest, a sense of respect, others' right. Oh. So therefore, the culture of peace, culture of nonviolence, culture of compassion is very much relevant to the Chinese people, like that. And then meanwhile, Tibet materially uh, poor, backward. So you see, remain within the people's of China. It's our interest built Tibet already you see, they carry a lot of constructions. Wonderful. But cultural aspect, uh, and then you see the Chinese, every Tibetan unique thing, you see the, these hardliner get suspicion. Oh, might be the seat of danger of separation. This is short-sightedness. And as I mentioned earlier, without lack of common sense. <laughs> so like that. I'm optimistic. Now, basically, people's probably China today, compare uh, 30, 40 years ago, much changed. And then present president, you see the Xi Jinping, you see his uh, one comment, I think three years ago, Barbeta, three years ago. Two, two. Ka. In the Paris day. Oh, day. Two years back. Oh, two years back, one in Paris, one in New Delhi. He publicly sort of expressed uh, Buddhism have very important role regarding Chinese culture. He publicly mentioned, I am surprised, a communist leader, you see, expressing something positive about Buddhism. And naturally, his family also Buddhist, like that. So like that. So, but you see, the whole system, totalitarian system. Uh, so the so long hardliners, they are. This is sometimes, sometimes difficult. So we'll see, we'll see. I think party meeting, uh, uh, 2017, the 19th party meeting, uh, will take place in China. So some people say, and then some change may happen. Many Chinese told me like that. So in any way, the political matter, I already retired. Since 2011, I totally retired. Not only I myself retired, but also four century old tradition. Dalai Lama institution automatically become head of both temporal and spirituality. Now that formally, uh, proudly, voluntarily ended. So sometimes I jokingly say, telling people, you see, that tradition started by fifth Dalai Lama, four centuries ago. So if fifth Dalai Lama reappear, then what he, what he will say? Uh, the supposed 14th Dalai Lama now voluntarily ended that. So, but there is no danger, reappear. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and to the students and to those online, thank you so much for joining us here. I think we've been profoundly challenged to understand that every time we walk away from compassion, we are dehumanised. You have seen courageous compassion here on the podium and the panellists, and we are reminded by their example that compassion is not a passive state. It's a state of action and of complicity 
in the upholding of human rights under all circumstances for each of us and for the sake of all of us. Please join me in thanking our panellists, the Graduate Institute and the organisers of this panel.